Okay, welcome to the third session of this course. And I will start with some um, not standard uh, ways of looking at the Fourier transform and recalling that when we deal in MATLAB with finite sequences, uh, they are actually functions on the unit circle. And the standard way to represent the unit circle is of course uh, by plotting dots or uh, multiples of an angle which divides 360 degrees. So of course, if you do it by hand, you would take unit roots of order eight or uh, multiples of 45 degrees. And we have to have a convention how to, where to start. And the convention is the first coordinate of the sequence is supposed to be the value at zero. And then we go in the mathematical positive sense. And we have eight such unit roots of order n. You can describe them as e to the two pi i uh, divided by eight uh, and then powers of this. So the primitive unit root of order eight is uh, what is depicted here as two, point number two, or cosine 45 degrees plus i times sine of cosine 45 degrees. Uh, but this is not important now. So simply the command unit roots of order n uh, gives you this code. And uh, maybe I think that shouldn't be too long. If I type it, you see here the expression is simply there exp by, done by the exponential. And I'm doing a linear spacing with n terms here with eight terms. And I'm starting from zero uh, to uh, and go to two pi. Uh, and of course I have to stop. So otherwise I would uh, identify, I would get nine values uh, or I would not get uh, the correct distance. So uh, I allow myself to have an input sometimes for plotting. It's good to connect the last one with the first one, but then, then it's not the unit roots of order n, but it's unit roots joined with the one. And that's why this command is here. So I'm just doing unit roots of order n and the plot num command uh, explains that I'm doing it with the blue dots and uh, that it's uh, getting the numbers which are the coordinates. Now, uh, the next thing which I'm doing now uh, for n, you see n is eight here, but you can do it for any possible value is uh, uh, to start now with random polynomial and random uh, uh, values. Okay, yeah. So, so this command uh, or this short test should convince you that the fundamental matrix is really uh, explaining the connection between the coefficients of a matrix and uh, the values of the polynomials. So let us quickly recall the polyval command. Polyval is saying, you give me the coefficients of a polynomial and I evaluate it at the points I set. And this can be a vector, so we were choosing n random vectors uh, of length eight. Uh, now, uh, the fundamental matrix depends only on the points. And uh, so it's uh, just uh, uh, a matrix built on the values of the powers of n set. And because uh, remember polyval of one, two, three is 123. The convention of MATLAB of using coefficients in decreasing order, uh, we also will see in the fundamental matrix that this is uh, done like this. And then in the next step, we show that the transition from the matrix, from, the, from a vector to a FFT or discrete Fourier transform is nothing else but the transition from the polynomial coefficients to the values at the unit roots of order n. So you can skip all this and read it later. The point is uh, I'm um, taking uh, the matrix uh, F8. It's not well defined here, so I probably should uh, re redo it. So uh, F8 is... Uh, is f of t of i of n of, of capital N 
and uh, I want to show you that uh, what is the A? Yeah, A is a column vector, so I can apply it. So I can say, let's try to first verify that this is the matrix realizing that would be the matrix describing the Fourier transform, which is a linear mapping. Okay, so uh, comp norm of F8, eight, applied to the vector column vector eight or apply F of T of A. And I'm learning this, maybe I'm doing, where's my MATLAB? I run this section. And you see it's exactly the same. And now I'm taking the matrix, uh, which is called F8 now, representing, and I compare it with the fundamental matrix corresponding to the unit roots for the M. Now you see it's, it's perfect, it's the same, but there are two extra tricks. One is that we have to flip left and right, which means Whereas the FFT is taking the polynomials in increasing order, MATLAB and Fundamount takes them in decreasing order. The second thing is, uh, you all know, but if you see the formula for the discrete Fourier transform, it's with a negative, which is, has to do that you're taking scalar products, and therefore you have to run through the unit roots of order n in opposite order, which means you are starting still with one, but then you're going in the clockwise sense. So conjugation of unit roots is, of course, taking the unit roots of order n. So this uh, verification tells you that the matrix representing the discrete Fourier transform is a fundamental matrix uh, with the choice that the coefficients are taken in increasing order. I'll explain the first part and uh, that the unit roots, the evaluation is done at the unit roots of order n in the clockwise sense. Now, I always like to use uh, a plot of this matrix, which is very nice and easy to remember if you have seen it once. So um, it's nice to choose a prime number and not too big and not too small. So 13, 17 are nice numbers. So what you see here is unit roots of order 13. And if you want to know what is, uh, for example, a row which corresponds to the third or fourth row, then you would say I have to jump from omega to the power zero to the third power. So you see the violet line, then the sixth power and so on. And you see it's because 13 is a prime number. It doesn't go through a zero again. So you have the, the violet line just covering until the end at some point it's uh, will be finished. But it's also nice to, to see um, other representations which we will see in a moment. Now, uh, I, in the preparation of this experiment, I uh, probably had some problems and I had to recall that I'm doing my, most of the signals that we have I'm doing them in the um, uh, row mode. So signals are showing up in as a row vectors. And maybe uh, I, maybe I'm showing you. So would be a nice Now I'm showing you that the, the matrix is symmetric. Uh, so uh, if I the comp norm of F8 and F8 conjugate, pardon, F8 transpose, which is conjugate uh, with dot, uh, then you will see that uh, maybe put I cannot put it here. So I run this. Yeah, okay. here I run this part. Then you see, of course, it's a symmetric matrix. And now the point is, why is the Fourier transform so important? And, uh, the explanation for engineers is that it's an operator which diagonalizes all the time invariant systems. So I want to explain next, what is an operator which is mapping 
Rn or Cn into Cn and commuting with uh, all the cyclic translations. So the first one is um, I wanted to show you what happens if you apply the rotation vector uh, to the unit matrix. And you see here, it's just if you do it minus one, uh, then you see that it makes uh, from the first vector, the second unit vector in the image of the second unit vector is the third one. And of course, the image of the last one is the first one. Now, if you want to, uh, so this is the, the exactly the matrix describing the cyclic shift in the forward direction. Uh, now here, uh, uh, in still in column uh, applied to columns. So uh, the inverse of this matrix is of course the backward shift, but I just apply the inverse command. So inverse of this is a, a, a backward shift. So the first vector is getting the last one and so on, and it's obvious. Now, uh, if I take the arithmetic progression which is uh, the vector one to five, but in order to apply it in the ordinary matrix sense, I'm uh, switching um, it to tr uh, transpose mode. So it's real valued. So it's just the column vector. Uh, and then I apply the T1 uh, to this uh, matrix. I'm getting uh, the vector which moves the one to the second position and so on. So it's really, the forward shift and uh, accordingly the inverse is the backward shift and so on. So these operators are also, if you look at them, what they are doing are obviously operators which are having the property that the fifth power in this case is the identity operator. They're also very obviously unitary operators, which means they preserve norms, so Euclidean norms of vectors because it's the same coordinates and therefore it preserves scalar products. And uh, every unitary operator, uh, of course, has the transpose conjugate as its inverse. Now, the inverse is either a left or right inverse. I'm talking now about matrix theory, and therefore it's a normal matrix. So any unitary or any symmetric or Hermitian matrix, but any unitary matrix is also normal, so it can be diagonalized with an or change of an orthonormal basis because we're in the complex domain. And therefore, you could say the only possible values of this operator are uh, unit roots of order five. And then you could ask, well, are there uh, uh, possible eigenvectors? And uh, the answer is essentially that you would take any, any, uh, any pure frequencies or any column, actually, actually also row of this full matrix. So I will do this in an experimental way. So when we start to discuss the question, when is a matrix describing a linear mapping from C5 into C5, which commutes with translation, then of course you would say, well, then this matrix has to have the property that if you multiply from the left or from the right, you get the same result. So maybe you will write it down on paper, but of course you can bring it on one side. You can say, well, the matrix is unchanged if you multiply uh, with the operator from the left and with the inverse operator from the right. So the operators which commute are essentially those who are invariant under the inner um, uh, under the conjugation with the operator doing the translation. So we know our test matrix, which is the matrix having one, two, three, four, five in the first column of uh, six, seven, and so on. So we know there the shape of this matrix. And so I'm doing now the conjugation and I'll observe what's going on. It moves the one from position one, one to position two, two but actually it moves everything along the main diagonal. You see here also the second column is, uh, you can read it as you want it, is, has been moved to the right and has been moved downwards. And of course you can remember that multiplying uh, a matrix like our T5 with a translation matrix, it applies to the columns and multiplying from the right, it applies to the rows. So we are just saying, 
Well, if you're moving both rows and columns by one in a cyclic way, so you're shifting along the diagonal in a cyclic way. So uh, we have another command, which we call rotate rows and columns, which means you're rotating in a cyclic way. So you don't have to do matrix multiplication for big matrices, but you're just more or less shifting your pixel image in a cyclic way. And you can say, I want to rotate it by seven rows and 12 columns, and then you have this command. Okay, so uh, now uh, there is a command which is called, okay, so maybe once more, looking at the picture above tells you that in any matrix you can do it and, and that here you see what happens, will be, um, and this describes an operator commuting with translations if and only if it's constant along the main diagonals. And there are essentially two easy ways to create a matrix from such a matrix from, from, uh, from a vector. You either just determine the first uh, column or you give the first row of the vector. So because we have already our arithmetic progression one to five available, uh, I was using the confmat command. And um, uh, I, first I'll show you that the convolution matrix, which has the first column being one to five, is the one where the rest is just filled by keeping constant one along the main diagonal, constant two along the side diagonal. And you also see the lower side diagonal is going here. So you, you would have at row number six, column number five, you expect the two, but of course, due to the cyclicity, it appears above. So um, in the cyclic understanding, every matrix has n by n matrix has n side diagonals, and uh, they are uh, described by the first column and by the first row. Now, an engineer would tell me, well, you're describing the convolution matrix because they are called convolution matrix matrices by uh, the impulse response. So if you would apply this matrix to the first unit vector, and we know that this is, will become our delta at zero, zero at zero, then you will get uh, the output of the delta zero and every convolution matrix can be obtained by do, uh, taking this output and copying it up to some translation or so. But uh, there's another way to say, well, how are you doing matrix multiplication? So if you have some input signal, then of course, everybody who knows how to do matrix multiplication will do a scalar product of the rows. So you see also the rows have a pattern. You have now the row vector one, five, four, three, two, and then you're shifting it to the right. And so um, if you take this profile and you would describe uh, this matrix, this succulent matrix, that's the technical terminology, by um, um, its action on the vector, you would say, oh, you're taking a, a scalar product and if that would be uh, adding up to one, you would say you're taking an average and then you're moving the average. So regarding the action of a circulant matrix by the application of the row vectors is describing a convolution operator as a moving average, whereas describing it through the columns would be the impulse response. Now it's also interesting to see here what is the connection between the first row and the first column and you will see it's exactly the conjugation. I mean, reading it in the opposite direction because you have to always think that these are functions on the unit or four to five. So it's not a flip, but a flip in the group theoretical sense. And this is quite important. And in the, the continuous theory, you can start from this to describe convolution operators. Now uh, you have might have seen and may remember that the symmetric filter of size seven is just a rectangular function, which is describing the fact that we are having signals of length uh, seven and uh, that the maximal frequency is one. So uh, you have 
at position zero zero in the Yundrut sense or at position one one in the MATLAB sense, you have one neighbor to the right and one to the left. Well, we don't see it on the screen, but if you go uh, in the column sense, you go down, one is uh, following this, and then the last one is on the opposite side. So this is um, such an operator. And now I'm doing matrix multiplication. I'm doing a, a matrix multiplication of this tridiagonal matrix, which has all ones on the main diagonal and the left and upper and lower side diagonal, once more taken in a cyclic way. And uh, we get this result. And uh, if you look at the result, you get three to one on both sides. So the peak value is three to one uh, linear decrease on one side and uh, on the other side. Now you can play around yourself with the same thing. And uh, you can find uh, maybe I'm doing something similar here. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'll do a section break. I'm doing uh, the well. The uh, filter f is just uh, one, 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 and then I'm saying what is the output? Uh, maybe f f is uh, the output of. Uh, convolution of one of, of f with f. And uh, of course you will should see, okay, I did a semicolon. It just takes a while, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, so you see it's uh, just this, uh, but of course uh, you can play around and just to say what is uh, 111 squared, and you will get the same number. So you see, as long as the uh, figures are very small, uh, multiplying integers or multiplying polynomials by the coefficients or creating from the coefficients circle and matrices and composing the circle and matrices is the same. Now, uh, we have seen or have used the matrix here. Uh, uh, this conformat of R, I didn't give it a name, R C or so, is the convolution matrix generated from the arithmetic progression. And uh, okay, so R was do it one five transpose. It works now. Yeah. Okay. So have, we have this convolution matrix. And then, of course, uh, it might be interesting to see RC uh, prime transpose conjugate RC prime. Maybe I'm in a section break afterwards. So you see that this is exactly. Uh, flipping, so now the moving average would be uh, with the first row and the, the flip would be this year. Yeah, I can maybe mention that uh, we have also a, con uh, uh, um, a command which is called involution because clearly flipping twice is the same. So let me see if it works here. The involution of, yeah, one, two, three, four, five is just one, five, three. You could play around with a complex valued function, then you would get the flip, I mean, the relabeling of the coordinates in this, but also with conjugation. So that's important. Okay, so we have seen uh, the convolution and the matrix. And now I'm doing a, a funny and nice experiment, which should be instructive to you. I'm creating a random co convolution matrix, or a random uh, circle and matrix. And here, now I'm choosing my standard signal size, which is 480. And uh, so conformat, as you have seen, creates such a matrix. I'm doing it in a way that's such that it's not only positive with values between one and zero, but between minus one half and plus one half. Um, 
And then I make it symmetric, a very naive trick to make a matrix, a random, to create some random matrix which is symmetric. And then I apply, because uh, it's a symmetric matrix, I can do the eigenvalues. Now, the eigenvalues may be complex, and uh, you see the diagonal matrix and the matrix with the, this MATLAB command with the eigenvectors is the matrix V. And I just expel uh, from the diagonal matrix the diagonal. So these are the eigenvalues. The next thing is I want to plot them as red dots. I want to show them to you. Now, this was not a unitary matrix, so there was no reason why these eigenvalues should be somehow uh, concentrated somewhere or so. Uh, of course, the eigenvalues cannot be larger than the matrix norm. So there is a limited resource. So it's not just a display of a segment, um, but uh, because the size of our coefficients was limited, all this, this is a quite cut of a random situation, maybe to just also to show you that it can be look in a different way. And also that uh, the computation of the eigenvalues is quite fast, even for MATLAB with size 480 or so. But you see these are random vectors, or uh, random uh, values in the complex domain. And also it's plausible that such a random matrix will have only one dimensional eigenspaces. So why should the polynomial uh, of um, degree 480 have multiple eigenvalues or so. So it's a very high chance that these are isolated values and therefore uh, we will get one dimensional things. And so uh, here uh, you see uh, in a co collected way um, the rows. And what I did was um, I was plotting in order to make it not too kind of too complicated or so and better visible what's going on. I was suggesting to take uh, some random columns. So I'm taking number, uh, I don't know, I'm jumping uh, by three. So I'm taking number 13, 16, 19 or so, but you can take any, any choice or so. And if you look at this and I'm doing this command, which is plot re, another little Newark command, which is plot the real imaginary part. And then you see that uh, these uh, are clearly pure frequencies. And because I'm cutting off at 50, uh, maybe I'm, I'm repeating this, maybe I'm showing you now more. And also I have meanwhile obtained a new plot. So if I rerun it, the plotting routines are a bit slow now, but you will see some other frequencies. And maybe now you see why I'm, I'm uh, taking shorter segments. Yeah, so maybe this is just a full clone. And here you see it's taking two long vectors is not a good idea. And so maybe I'm going back and plot from one to 80 or so, one to 80 and try to repeat this experiment. But the point is, uh, even if you say, I have no idea about the Fourier transform, I just want to diagonalize uh, circulant matrices because these are exactly the ones which commute with translation. Uh, eventually, so to say, assume the very naive viewpoint that somebody would have only MATLAB available, never have heard about the Fourier transform. So he would be able to reinvent the discrete Fourier transform because it's the only way to diagonalize uh, the, okay, there is some, I see, of course, there's a typo. It should be from one to 18, that's why it didn't work. So it's the only way to diagonalize this. Let me see, just wait until we see a little bit of this plot. Yeah, maybe just look at the, these uh, values here. So you see these are pure frequencies and you see some of them are low frequencies, some of them are high frequencies. And it's also interesting to note that the last ones are actually the low frequencies, but going in the opposite direction. It's just running through the unit roots in the opposite order. 
uh, if you're asking in the discrete setting, what is the maximal frequency, then of course uh, you should, uh, maybe I'm, I'm doing this now. So I'm doing F is uh, F of T of I, uh, I of N. So that's 480, we don't want to see it, uh, but we want to plot uh, the row number because rows are the same as column number three. So how many plot real, yeah, maybe I take the plot C command. It's putting the zero in the middle. So maybe I'm making a new figure to be sure. Also, I think it should work here. Uh, so the pure frequency, uh, which you see here is uh, with the zero. And what you can see here is the blue part must be the real part because it's the cos like a cosine. And the red part is the sinus, but actually it's the sinus in the opposite direction, sinus of minus X, or you go in the other direction. Uh, now, what would be the highest frequency? So we have to recall, uh, yeah, maybe, so yeah, maybe you can also see how many full oscillations do you see? Clearly two full oscillations. So column number one would represent zero oscillation. So it would be just constant one in the blue form and red is zero, no imaginary part. A pure cosine sine with one full oscillation is the second column. And now I would suggest to look at uh, this in the opposite direction. So we may take N minus two, maybe I'm taking N minus three. Oops, not good. Yeah. And uh, so as opposed to our random experiment, now everything is well sorted and you see, uh, because of the conjugation, this is uh, the series in the middle. So maybe I'm doing a plot X so that you see the axis in the middle. Uh, so the blue part again is the cosine part. Uh, yeah, so that was not good. Uh, and the sign part is, is exactly as you expected. And because now uh, we are going to the left, so zero is already the first component. So the first component to the left will be cosine and sine. The second one will be uh, cosine and sine with two periods. And since we are taking the third one, it's now with three oscillations. Okay, so we have now a way to create uh, those matrices. And uh, I think I should uh, stop here for a little moment and save this and actually stop the recording also.